Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're currently going through the book of Romans, verse by verse, and we are in Romans chapter 3, and we left off last time in verse 12, <clears throat> and I said we're going to have some unfinished business in that verse, so we'll pick it up in verse 12. If you can get your Bible, that would be wonderful, because it's always good to have your copy of Scripture before you so that you can read it as well as hear it. So, while you're doing that, I will remind you quickly that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And for those of you who do not know, you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation, in-depth Bible study, verse by verse, three complete series, almost four entire series, going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. And all you have to do is click and listen. Study at your pace, at your convenience, the whole counsel of God, it's all important at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in verse 9, Romans 3. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no way. For we have before proved both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. I don't know if I said this last time, I don't think I did. But when it says that there are none that seeketh after God, that might surprise you, some of you who are Christians, because you no doubt felt that you were seeking God. And that's why you cried out to him for mercy through Jesus Christ and received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I know that's, I remember feeling that way myself. I was involved in a Bible study shortly after I was saved. This was, again, almost 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, probably. And we were talking, and I said, you know, I just, I, I remember being so hungry for God. I was seeking after God. And humanly speaking, that is true, and it was true with me, and it was probably true with you too. But here the Bible says, there is none that seeketh after God. You know what that means? apart from the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, no one seeks after God. Because people run away from God. Sinners run away from God. That's why when I hear modern evangelicals say, well, you know, talking to the unsaved, you know, the worst part about hell is that God won't be there. That is spoken by someone who is totally clueless. They've been around their evangelical subculture so long and so much that they don't have any idea what, was, what life is like in the realm of the unsaved. They've got their little subculture and they live there and they get their entertainment there and they watch their movies there and everything is, is in that little subculture. And they're totally clueless. I know they're clueless to make a stupid statement like that. Number one, it's unbiblical. The worst part of hell is not that God won't be there. The worst part of hell, my friends, is the part that Jesus talked about time and time again. Eternal fire that burns, that torments, that tortures. That, my friend, is the worst part of hell. Don't water down the word of God to try to cater to lukewarm Christians or the unsaved by saying 
that the worst part of hell is, is God won't be there. It's the fire. That's what Jesus talked about. It's the fire. It's the burning. It's the torment. It's the torture. It's the unending state of horror. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. That's the worst part of hell. And besides, this is why I know you're spending too much time in your evangelical subculture when you actually think, number one, you have no biblical support at all for saying that. Number two, if you think that that is going to move or non Christians, the unsaved, to receive Christ, you are out of your lo ever loving mind. I got news for you, man. I got news for you, evangelical. The unsaved don't want to be around God. You're not going to get them to be saved because God won't be there. That's exactly what they want. An eternity without God to mess them up from their perverted way of thinking? Man, that's great. That's great. No more God. That's wonderful. They haven't thought that through, but that's what they think. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God because sinners don't want to be in God's presence. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to woo them to come to Christ, to make them feel guilty over their sin, to make them understand that they are going to burn in hell. If you would bother telling them that, my friends, if you would bother telling them that, the Holy Spirit will use that truth to cause somebody to repent. But I guarantee he's not going to use that ridiculous statement that, well, the worst part of hell is that God won't be there. You're going to hear thunderous applause coming from the unsaved if you say that. Twelve. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Unprofitable means worthless. God just said that every single human being is worthless. That's what God says about us. Every one of us, we're all worthless. Sin has destroyed man and made him worthless in the eyes of God. And of course, this is not a very popular message even among Christians today, which is why so many untruths are told about man's depravity. I heard an evangelical preacher a while back, and actually I've heard many over the years say that we are, we are of such great worth to God. He died on the cross to pay for our sins because we were of such great worth to him. That sounds real good. But again, it has no biblical support. We are of such great worth to God. Well, that's funny because God says there is none who do good. God says we have all become worthless. So I ask you, who are you going to believe? God or preachers? who say that sort of stuff. Because you can't believe both. You have to choose. Are you going to believe God? Are you going to believe the Word of God? Or are you going to believe some modern evangelical preacher who wants to be popular and wants a big offering so he says stuff like, you are of such great worth to God, butter ye up, build up your self-esteem, which is a joke, it's a lie. But I've heard it. You probably have too. I know I'm not the only one. I've heard Christian preachers say, Jesus died on the cross because you are worth so much when the exact opposite is true. The, things that, the thing that makes God's grace so amazing 
And the thing that makes his love so amazing is that he suffered and died for worthless sinners. If Jesus died on the cross for us because we were so lovable, then his death would have nothing to do with his grace. Instead, we would have earned it to some, to some extent by being so lovable. See, many modern evangelicals rewrite the scripture to say God so loved the world because we were so irresistible that he gave his only begotten son. Because we were so irresistible. How could he resist loving us? That's what's taught in one form or another. That's what people want to think. And that's what is taught because that's what people want to think. And it makes them feel good about themselves. It's just not true. And those preachers will stand before Almighty God and give an account for degrading the grace of God and making it seem like his death on the cross was something that he owed us because there was something of such great value in us. Nonsense. That's what makes his grace so amazing. God does not love us because we are lovable or because we are of such great worth. He loves us because it is his nature to love. And I know that that truth will not make us feel good about the human race or about ourselves, but it should make us feel good about God, and it should also make us grateful that he is so gracious, which he is. 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. People use their tongues in very nasty ways sometimes. We've probably all experienced words that bite like vipers. And in fact, those kind of words are worse than the bite of a viper because a lot of times you never forget nasty words that have been spoken to you. 14. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. People curse. People curse. They take God's name in vain or when something happens that they don't like, they use other words to curse. People think, people think way too highly of themselves. And it goes back in part to what I just talked about in the previous couple of verses. How, how preachers are just like the unsaved world, unsaved counselors who build up your self-esteem and build up your so-called self-worth. So then you get people who are thinking way too highly of themselves and somehow they think that they deserve to have things their way, which is why they get upset, which is why they curse when that's not the case or strike someone when that's not the case or become bitter when that's not the case because their self-esteem is so high because they think they're of such great worth if they only knew what God really thinks of them and God's evaluation of them they would never curse when something bad happened they would know that regardless how bad it is they deserve physical death and eternal hell. And anything, anything better than that is a product of God's grace. 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And of course, not every human being is a murderer, but every human being has hated. And according to Jesus, that's murdering someone in your heart. It doesn't matter if it's murder or hatred. The point is people are so selfish and so corrupt that they don't see any problem in either hating another human being or taking it one step further further in murdering someone who is in created who's been created in the image and likeness of God. 
That person angered me so much that I'm going to snuff out his or her life just because she did it or he did it. And I'm going to be justified in doing it too. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be angry at them and I'm going to remain angry and I'm not going to forgive and I'm going to be bitter. I don't care if it kills me and sends my soul to hell because I'm justified in doing it because they've been so bad to me. Carry on. 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways. You know, the reason that this world has so many problems is that sinful man keeps doing things their way instead of God's way. And that's why you have destruction. <laughs> that's why you got misery. It's in their way. It's in their paths. They leave a trail of it because they do things their way instead of God's way. 17. And the way of peace have they not known? Sinful, self-centered man will never have peace. That peace that they say that they want. People want peace. And people sing about peace. And poets write about peace. Until someone else has something that they want, then they throw the lofty idea of peace right out the window. People want peace until someone says something that they don't like. Then again, they throw that lofty idea of peace right out the window. People want sin more than they want peace, which is why in all of human recorded history, at least 6,000 years of human history, the amount of years in which no countries, no cities, or tribes waged official war with each other is most certainly less than 300 years. Now you think about that. Less than 300 years of peace in at least 6,000 years of human ex existence. Why? Because people are sinners. And that makes them selfish. And that makes them greedy. 300 years of peace in 6,000 plus years of human existence. And lately, it hasn't been any better. You say, well, we've become more sophisticated. No. In fact, since the beginning of World War I in 1914, there has been continual conflict someplace in this world which was as i make this video 106 years ago 106 straight years of continual conflict somewhere in this world <clears throat> why because people are sinners the way of peace they have not known because they're following their own ways for this it's the same reason that destruction and misery is in their paths because people follow their own ways. People try to exclude God from their life and they think they're going to have a better life. And they think they're going to have a better society, a better country. The Democratic Party in the United States has excluded God from, from society, from their platform. They don't want anything to do with them. <sighs> better move on. Verse 18, and notice what it says. There is no fear of God before their eyes. <clears throat> and that is the problem in a nutshell. That is the fundamental problem with man. And it is also the root of all sin and of all of sin's terrible consequences. Man does not fear God enough to stay away from doing evil. 19. <clears throat> Just hold it a second. One of the reasons that man does not fear God enough to stay away from evil is that many, many preachers who claim to believe the Bible don't preach against sin and never mention hell.
and the wrath and the judgment of God. That's why. A big reason why there's no fear of God. 19. Now we know that whatever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. God's law was never intended to be a means to salvation. It was given to show us that we are sinners and guilty before God. Verse 20. <clears throat> Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. There are those who believe that if they do a pretty good job of keeping the commandments, then they will be saved. There are those who believe that if you keep the commandments more than you break them, or if you don't break any of the so-called big ones, then you will be okay. There are others who think, well, I know I, I, I know I break the commandments sometimes, but I don't break the commandments nearly as much as a lot of other people, so I'll go to heaven. There are people who think that sort of thing, those sorts of things. But the Bible says that no one is saved by the commandments. The purpose of the commandments was to show us and is to show us that we have disobeyed God, that we have fallen short of his standard of perfection, needed to get into heaven, and therefore we need a savior. That's the reason for the commandments, as well as to show us how God wants us to live, obviously. But it's also to show us that we don't keep them, that we're not, we don't measure up and we need a savior as a result. 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. God doesn't save anyone by his law. But he doesn't leave us hanging out there with no hope either. We are not righteous enough to save ourselves, but God has a perfect righteousness that he will give us and that perfect righteousness is his. 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon them and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. If, if something must get done and you can't do it, then you have to trust in someone else who can. I can't do plumbing. I tried. I tried, and I swear I'd never try again. I can't do plumbing. I certainly can't do electrical. So if I need those things done, I can't work on my car either. I laid in enough snow banks with a hammer and a crescent wrench during high school changing starters and generators and who knows what else. Enough to know that, forget it. I can't do it, and I don't want to learn. I can't do plumbing. I can't do electrical. I can't fix cars. So if I need any of those things done, I have to put my faith in a plumber, an electrician, or an auto mechanic. And that's how salvation works as well. We can't save ourselves. We don't have what it takes. So we have to put our trust in someone who can save us, and that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. If we realize that, and that's first step. If we realize that we cannot save ourselves and we put our trust in Jesus to save us, then he will do that. We are saved by putting our faith in Christ and his death on the cross, which accomplishes that which we could never accomplish. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So here we go. He already said this earlier in so many words, but he emphasizes it. And what stands out to me in this verse is that we are all in the same boat. There's not a bit of difference between any of us. 
as far as God is concerned, as far as being capable of being fit for heaven, we're all in the same sinful boat. None of us are perfect. And that means that we're all in trouble because perfection is needed to get into heaven. 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are not righteous. We are guilty and we are condemned. But if we put our faith in the death of Christ on the cross, then God declares us righteous. God justifies us, which means he, as judge, officially declares us to be righteous. 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Meaning, all people in the Old Testament who had faith in God and believed God when he said that he would eventually send a Savior to pay for our sins, all those people who truly believed that went to paradise after they died. God did not punish them for their sins because they had faith in the Savior who was yet to come. And today, we look back on Calvary. They look forward to Calvary. We look back to Calvary, and we know who that Savior is, is Jesus. The death of Jesus on the cross pays for the sins of the people who trusted God before Jesus died to pay for those sins. See how that worked? The death of Jesus on the cross pays for the sins of the people who trusted God before and after Christ actually died and paid for those sins. As a result, God does not violate his just character by not punishing them, even though they are guilty. God's justice was satisfied because Jesus Christ was punished in the place of the Old Testament people of God and in, in our, our place today. His justice was satisfied by the death of his Christ, paid for our sins, paid in full. 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Christians are saved and headed for heaven, but not because of anything good that they have done. Christians have no reason to boast. No one in heaven is boasting. If you think that you're going to boast about your salvation, I got news for you. You'll be doing all your boasting in hell and you'll be wondering what you're doing in the lake of fire because no one in heaven boasts. Everyone in heaven, all Christians, are, saved, are sinners saved by the mercy of God and only by the mercy of God, and they know that full well. 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Those who say we, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, but, 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 we must also keep this particular law and that particular law or go through this ritual or that ritual. Those who say that we have to receive Christ, but we have to keep the law, and if, and if not keep it perfectly, well, at least give it our best shot, they are wrong. Law-keeping has absolutely nothing to do with us being saved. Salvation is all about what Jesus has done on the cross, not what we attempt to do or do here on earth. And I'm out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. This has been a faith ministry over for over 30 years. If you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for the Word of God. Pray for me. Also, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Let's stand together and get out God's word. 
I'd appreciate it. And until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.